Greetings from wherever you're signing in from. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, again, uh, welcome to today's IWCS uh, webinar. Um, my name is Dave Cadu. Uh, I am your IWCS uh, CEO and, and director, and I will be your moderator uh, for today's uh, webinar. Uh, we have a few housekeeping items just to get started. Uh, again, please note that as an attendee, uh, you're part of a wider audience. Uh, so during the presentation, all participants uh, will uh, be in listen only mode. And uh, also as a reminder, uh, this event is being recorded uh, for rebroadcast and to capture it on our website uh, in case you wish to uh, watch it again. Uh, we encourage you to submit written questions uh, at any time during the presentation uh, using the chat panel on the right of your screen uh, in the IWCS uh, webinar platform. After typing your questions uh, in the space at the bottom, uh, hit the send button. And again, your questions will be addressed, uh, time permitting, at the end of the presentation. Uh, our IWCS webinar series event is hosted by the Cable and Connectivity Industry Forum. And uh, today we welcome uh, Paul Brigandi. Uh, he's the application technology leader at Dow uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, USA. Uh, Paul will be presenting his paper uh, on material solutions for 5G and dense fiber networks. Uh, Dr. Paul Brigandi is Applications Technology Leader for Dow Packaging and Specialty Plastics Wire and Cable uh, Business in North America, uh, based in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Paul has experience in the power transmission and distribution, as well as telecommunication markets uh, focused on research and development of new insulation, jacket, conductive composites, and polymer modifier material developments. His technical expertise includes formulation and processing of polyolefins, elastomers, and polymer composites. Paul is active in several industry organizations, including the Insulated Conductors Committee, uh, the Communications Cable and Connectivity Association, uh, and the Fiber Broadband Association Technical Committees. He also serves as the first vice president uh, and on the board of directors of the Society of Plastics Engineering uh, Engineers, uh, the Palisades Mid-Atlantic section. And Paul earned his doctorate degree in polymer science and engineering from Lehigh University uh, and a bachelor of science in chemical engineering from the University of Delaware. Uh, Paul is also active as an adjunct uh, professor at Lehigh University in the material science and engineering department. So we welcome Paul to present at today's IWCS webinar event. Uh, so thank you, Paul. All right, thank you, Dave. I appreciate the invite uh, on behalf of everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar this morning and I'm glad to be here to present on behalf of my colleagues uh, that worked on this paper for development of material solutions, uh, looking at 5G and, and dense fiber networks. Uh, I trust you can hear me okay? Yep. Great. All right, so we'll go through a little bit of an introduction today. Um, the key drivers behind the developments that we're working on, mainly gonna focus on uh, some of the mini and micro fiber optic cables uh, that are becoming more, more prevalent uh, in the marketplace today. We'll look at our jacket compound performance. Um, so key things that we'll look at are shrinkage, performance, uh, coefficient of friction, laser marking, the mechanical properties, uh, combining it all together in, into one, one material that will help facilitate uh, installation. Uh, for these applications. Uh, we'll also touch on uh, microducts. And so new materials that we have developed for this area, uh, essentially looking at this as a full solution uh, opportunity 
here to help the industry facilitate this uh, deployment of, of new networks. And then we'll go through the, the wrap up. So I think this is really no secret to anyone on the phone, right? Our connectivity is driving uh, the growth in this marketplace and, and it's been going for some time and, and now we're seeing it really start to ramp up, right? So connecting more devices, people uh, and things with an increasing need for more bandwidth uh, as well as lower, lower latency. Um, when we get into things like the 5G trends and fiber to the X or home building antenna, uh, internet of things, and, and now we've just seen the passage of the infrastructure package investments and the significant um, you know, broadband investment that we'll be able to take from this. Uh, and you know, I, I think we all kind of continue to have some sort of remote work, school, uh, medical. These areas are really driving the need for more, more and more bandwidth and thus more cable. And so that's a great thing for all of us on the call today. What we want to talk about and focus on is really the densification and installation for these mini and micro cable constructions. So here we're dealing with smaller cables with more fiber going into limited spaces. We want to follow the continued movement of cable jetting in these micro ducts. Uh, Really looking for lighter weight and easier installation. So we're moving uh, steel, steel armor components, looking for thinner jackets that are tougher uh, and can be produced uh, at faster speeds and, and installed and provide the same protection. Really looking for longer blowing distances, getting more cable in, in faster, and really taking advantage of future expansions uh, when we talk about the, the multi, multiple pathways that, that the new ducts uh, and um, configurations can provide. So we're really looking at <clears throat> things like 58% smaller cables, 70% lighter. These are really the drivers uh, in, in this case. And so if we just compare, um, you know, the typical characteristics of these cables, uh, which, you know, most on this call are going to be uh, even more familiar with. You know, we're really looking at moving from the standard fiber cables uh, with the thicker wall jackets um, and, you know, 300 fiber count or so cables, loose tube to, you know, these mini and even micro cables where diameters now have shrank down you know, less than three millimeters, uh, jacket thicknesses going from uh, one and a half millimeters down to uh, you know, 0.25 to 0.3 millimeters and ever increasing fiber counts, as well as number of cables being installed in, <clears throat> in an existing duct, um, you know, or future pathways, right? More cables in, in new ducts. So really what we're looking at as far as fiber densification and the key trends, we're, we're, we're here to provide some some improvements and ways to facilitate <clears throat> and help those to accommodate these higher fiber counts, lower the installation costs, and really look at improving the identification as these cables get smaller and are pushed through the, through the ducts to minimize any uh, disruption on the, on the print markings. So we're really looking at low shrinkage, so keeping the signal quality high, uh, while also maintaining that toughness of the thinner wall jackets. We're looking at lowering the coefficient of friction even below what can be done today with typical uh, polymeric materials to facilitate the, the installation and, and improve the blowing distance. Uh, and as I said, laser marking really to replace the, the uh, inkjet printing, uh, which has its own challenges, particularly as you start to get into the uh, smaller cables, the ability to print uh, becomes more difficult. And so we're looking to do this with fast marking speed and really no need for surface treatments or, or any uh, additional things uh, beyond use of the, the material. So what I'll focus on today are a few different uh, HDP jacket compounds uh, labeled as follows. Uh, we'll have a control 
which is a commercial material used in the industry today. Uh, we'll have our low shrink, so LS will be low shrink. Uh, LP designation is for laser printable, uh, and LCF is low coefficient of friction. So anything from uh, low shrinkage alone, uh, all the way up to a combined product of low shrinkage, laser print, uh, and low COF all combined in one package, depending on your, your needs and the application needs. So the first thing we'll look at is cable design shifts and the new low shrinkage solution. And what we're looking at here is really the improved protection, as I mentioned, uh, with lower shrinkage than, than normal uh, or typical HDP jackets. Uh, so what we've done to try and simulate uh, some of the cyclic uh, aging that's done based on our capabilities uh, within our laboratory <clears throat> has really been to test, uh, you know, as follows from 40C to, to 100C uh, over a period of uh, about a day or so uh, and run several cycles throughout. Right. And so this is one way that we're able to simulate. It doesn't match up exactly to uh, some of the other field tests, but uh, this is what we're able to, to do to try and simulate. And we've done some correlations, which actually line up fairly close with uh, relative performance that, that we've seen. Um, and so the key, really the key takeaway is as we look at the average uh, shrinkage following this shrinkage uh, cyclic uh, aging, is you can see where shrink, shrinkage is about 3% for a <clears throat> normal control cable. We're able to lower that by almost 30% or so uh, with, with the low shrinkage materials. And so what you see is obviously all these are uh, the low shrinkage performance, uh, relatively about the same. Uh, and so the impact of the additional functionalities do not, do not hurt uh, the shrinkage performance in some cases slightly improved, but I would say all, these are all about the same. And so we're, we're able to lower the shrinkage by, by almost 30% in these cases. Now we'll look at the coefficient of friction, again, for faster and easier installation. So, so these compounds, typically your high density uh, polyethylenes are gonna have the uh, lowest coefficient of friction uh, amongst the polyethylene type jacketing materials, uh, even, and even so, uh, probably lower than, than many of the other materials used as well. Uh, but again, kind of in the polyethylene family, HDP is going to have the lowest. And so here we're actually looking at further improvements over the HDP itself, um, and actually looking at it over a wide uh, a range of temperatures and different aging time. And so there's two, really two key points that, that we see from this data. Right? We've aged uh, these cables for uh, up to four weeks at room temperature. So relatively close to 23 to 25 degrees C, as well as some elevated temperatures uh, close to 55 degrees C. And so we have our control, which we measured initially um, and you can see it's, it's kinetic coefficient of friction is just above 0.3. Uh, really the key finding here on the materials overall is, is we're able to drop the COF by about 70% uh, when we look at the low COF samples. We actually see some reduction in the uh, low shrinkage material. Uh, so it is an improvement uh, over the control but really the key is the finding that uh, we can lower the COF by about 70% uh, with the low COF samples. The second key point is, right, we actually see this stable over time. So as we age the samples, you actually see stable <coughs> coefficient of friction um, out to four weeks uh, under the given aging conditions. You know, so this is important because it's not, uh, you know, we're trying to take advantage of ways that we're not utilizing migratory, uh, typical migratory additives where uh, you're looking for blooming to the surface, which can cause residue and, and loss of function over time. Uh, these, are, these are meant to be stable as we look at uh, time and temperature.
Now we'll look at uh, laser marking. So what we've done here is actually uh, sent, sent uh, some materials out to be laser marked. And that's what you see here. These are uh, compression molded plaque specimens here uh, where we've looked at the standard HP, HDP jacket, the laser print low shrink and the laser print low shrink, uh, low COF uh, jacket. So a couple key things that you'll see from this picture, uh, right, is the first one is very low contrast when we consider the highly loaded carbon blocks or the two and a half percent uh, loaded carbon black sample. So you, so you don't get as good a print contrast there when you have the high loadings of, of carbon black. And thus these laser printable versions take advantage of uh, being able to lower the carbon black loading such that you can print um, but also and, and maintain that print quality uh, that, that you're looking for. Uh, the other key thing is actually the introduction, as I mentioned previously or alluded to, right? The addition of the COF performance does actually does not impede the uh, ability to laser print these these cables. So typically, where um, you know migratory additives to achieve COF um, reduce COF may uh, impede surface quality, whether it's ink or potentially laser. Uh, in, in this case, we're able to maintain that contrast. Um, and so, you know, the one thing that, that we don't, didn't cover in this paper, and we actually covered in a, a previous paper as we get into uh, looking at laser print, is that we are also able to introduce uh, the UV performance, right? So we are able to maintain uh, UV performance in the field, even though uh, these materials will contain le less than less than the two and a half percent carbon black that's, that's uh, typically used. Uh, and so that was the topic of a, a previous paper. <clears throat> now we look at our mecha the mechanical properties. So in this case, really looking at the tensile strength and, and the elongation at break. Um, really what we're looking at here is maintaining um, the, the performance uh, that the industry knows. Uh, and once for these materials, uh, so compared to the control. Uh, but actually what you see is, is you do see a slight improvement in mechanical properties uh, for the, the various uh, materials. So whether it's low shrink or all the way up to the, the low shrink, uh, laser print, low COF, um, we're able to take advantage of these added functionalities and again, maintain the mechanical performance uh, of the uh, material on the cables. So that's about the jacketing materials that you would see on cable. The, the one other thing that we did want to highlight, uh, you know, as we look at this material, this uh, space as a whole, uh, was some of the work that's been done in our uh, conduit area. So we have also developed high density polyethylene uh, microduct materials. And in combination with those new jacket materials, really expect to have uh, even further high efficiency insta installations. Um, so really what we compare here, uh, kind of more uh, tailored toward the, the conduit uh, space itself, is this new bimodal high density polyethylene. So uh, looking at higher flow um, and also higher density uh, material. So in this case, what we can do is uh, provide improved processability um, as well as improved uh, performance. So higher stiffness and toughness uh, as we look to down gauge, right? So the higher density, this higher flex mod flexural modulus, uh, the new bimodal materials while maintaining excellent processability uh, to meet these uh, ASTM cell classifications, uh, we're able to achieve that and provide long service life and really lower life cycle costs, uh, as well as higher temperature performance. So where we're looking at um, extreme temperatures, whether it be hot or cold, um, as well as I mentioned, this higher stiffness is really the driver, right? As we, as we down gauge, whether it be for the cables and as well as looking at the conduits, we can, we can down gauge. 
Uh, and this higher flow has really enabled up to 10% uh, faster uh, processing on, on typical lines. So combining, combining really this, this material plus the jacket, uh, we're, we're looking at improving that uh, coefficient of friction as well. And, and this combination providing even longer jetting distances uh, for, for field installations. So really looking at this from both aspects, uh, from the wire and cable side on the jacket, uh, as well as from uh, more the conduit uh, micro duct side uh, and, and combining the material solutions. So just in summary, uh, we've looked at these high density jacket compounds that, that we can design for an optimal balance of properties, depending on what uh, application areas that you're working in. Uh, whether it be for mini and micro cables or, or other applications, be it uh, data centers, uh, et cetera. We've shown the ability to have lower cyclic shrinkage, uh, higher stiffness, a lower COF, uh, and excellent laser marking compared to traditional materials uh, that are used in the field, uh, as well as this complementary bimodal high density polyethylene. Uh, for the microducts to allow for higher stiffness and toughness. Uh, so whether you're looking to improve uh, processing on your lines uh, or take advantage of a tougher material that is, enables some down gauging uh, while maintaining toughness. And really combining these two within the system, we can optimize the overall system and look at the lower life cycle costs as we get into uh, these 5G networks, uh, you know, the increased uh, broadband uh, drivers from the investments and all the fiber that, that will be deployed uh, in the coming years. Uh, so with that, I will conclude. I'll leave my contact information here and, and field any questions that, that you might have. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I do invite... Uh, the uh, participants, the attendees to type in any questions you may have for Paul at this time and we'll, uh, we'll address them to Paul as, as time permits. Um, one question, Paul, um, we've heard a lot uh, over the years of uh, rodent attack on some of these cables and things like that. Have you considered, uh, you know, rodent resistant additives in uh, some of these materials? That's a, that's a great question. We have had efforts looking at rodent resistance. Um, in this case, we have not looked at those other additives uh, in this case. Okay, but I, I, I know we've seen uh, in IWCS several presentations on additives that can be made. And I assume that's during extrusion, you would add add some, yeah. some kind of uh, additive. But anyway, um, you might want to refer to slide seven. I believe that was regarding the testing on coefficient of friction. But um, why not run the cycling temperatures uh, into the negative range? Or, or have you done that? And, and what kind of results might you have uh, yeah. in the negative, like minus 40 degrees C, for example? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And actually something that we have looked at, as I mentioned, we actually, unfortunately, our capability in our lab today, we can't really get that cycle from very low to, to the higher temperatures. So we don't have the setup for that. Um, we have sent some material out just recently and are getting some data back that... Uh, Suggest relative performance is close. The, not, the absolute numbers uh, seem to shift a little bit. And from what I remember, actually lower. Um, but relative to each other, the, the overall percentage uh, difference is, is similar. Uh, but it is something that we're looking at trying to be able to bring in-house to, to do the wider temperature ranges. Great. Um... On slide eight, uh, uh, it was observed that you did the aging at 55 degrees C versus 
a typical aging temperature for 60 degrees C rated materials, which is typically done at 85 degrees C. Is there a reason why you did the aging at 55 as opposed to 85 degrees C? Yeah, I would say in this case, what we were kind of trying to do was more of a relative simulation to maybe field field aging. Uh, I think um, yeah, we kind of settled in the in the middle of you know a typical ambient condition to to the very high and just looking to get a relative sense of um, you know if there was any migration or anything that we saw as far as impact on on COF, we, we didn't really get into the upper extremes uh, on the plaque, plaque testing anyway, but it's certainly something we can consider. Yeah, and I think it's just related to what's normally performed for- Correct, the yeah, and we were just ICD really looking ratings. more at the, really looking more for performance as might, might be related to real sitting around or, or over average over time. Um, reality, basically. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, did you imply that uh, non-migratory additives are used to achieve low coefficient of friction? So yeah, basically what I said is we're we're not looking to use migratory additives here to get uh, get the performance, right? So we're we're taking advantage of some other uh, technology that that we've got. Um, and so we're not really relying on the migratory nature of, uh, you know, a blooming additive to, to modify the surface. Fair enough. Um, what was the percent of carbon black uh, if it was less than 2.5%? Yeah, that's a great, great question, um, but I won't be able to answer that uh, here. So we can need maybe follow up afterwards for, be more of a proprietary uh, formulation. Uh, understood. So uh, you can reach reach out to Paul. I'll provide his contact points here in just a second sure. when we're done the questioning. But uh, uh, obviously, a, a good question. Uh, how does this bimodal grade compare with existing bimodal high density polyethylene grades on the market? Yeah, so one of the, um, as, I, as I mentioned, kind of the, the, the two key areas that um, this, this product uh, that, that's now you know, in the field has over existing is uh, really the, the higher flow, um, so improved processing um, in, in one regard. Uh, but then the combination with with this higher density and you know molecular architecture for the the higher stiffness um, that we that we get with uh, with this combined uh, you know this bimodal. So it's really really a combination of the flow and the toughness uh, that uh, from from what we've seen is uh, is really the unique factors here. Okay. Um, again, it was an excellent presentation. I, I don't see any more questions. If, if anyone has another question, uh, please make sure you enter it now. Uh, we'll have one last chance to, to see them. Uh, but again, I, I want to thank uh, Paul uh, tremendously for uh, participating today in, in this presentation. Uh, this paper was presented uh, in our October IWCS 2021 Cable and Connectivity Industry Forum, and it was paper 5-1. Uh, these will be, uh, the paper itself will be archived uh, on uh, our website, and this webinar will as well. Um, to, uh, to see here now, we've got, uh, uh, please note the contact points here for, for Paul. Again, if, if you want to go offline and, and ask Paul any questions, uh, he'd be happy to, to respond and, and, and talk with you. Um, so you can contact him after today's event. Uh, each of these IWCS webinars, series, presentation events are recorded, and they will be archived on our website, the IWCS.org website. 
Uh, and it normally takes up to a week or, or a little bit more to have these posted. Uh, the IWCS webinar series will conduct uh, technical paper presentations, um, um, as well as sponsored company events uh, several times each month. Our next scheduled technical uh, paper presentation webinar event will be on Friday, February the 18th. Uh, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Uh, typically, we try to be uh, on the third Friday of every month, but uh, we may uh, increase that. So keep an eye on your inbox as to the announcements for, for these technical paper webinars. Uh, each of you will be receiving the announcements, uh, but please feel free to share those announcements with your colleagues uh, within your own company or even in your supply chain, your customers or, or uh, suppliers, uh, so that they can join and register as well. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Becky, uh, do we see any more questions for Paul that came in late? Dave, I do not see any more questions. All right, excellent. And again, that's a testament to uh, a great presentation and, and uh, the messages that you delivered. Um, it's important that uh, we recognize and thank our IWCS partner level sponsors uh, who contribute greatly to the success of our cable and connectivity industry forum. Uh, without their strong leadership uh, and generosity, we would not be able to bring these important technical innovations and information to you uh, and our global community. Again, thank you to these leading suppliers in our industry for your unwavering support. Um, for over 70 years, IWCS Cable and Connectivity Industry Forum has been the recognized leader showcasing new technologies in cable and connectivity products, processes, and applications. Uh, with all of our perseverance and, and confidence, uh, our next 71st annual Cable and Connectivity Industry Forum will now take place live on Monday uh, through Thursday, October 10th through the 13th, 2022 at the Rhode Island Convention Center in Providence, Rhode Island, USA. Uh, if if uh, you have joined us at, at previous conferences, you know that uh, we, we go to Providence on a regular basis, so we look forward to you joining us again there. Uh, please watch your inbox, uh, any social media, uh, and our website uh, to learn more as the exciting information becomes available. And also be on the lookout for the call for papers that will be coming here shortly so that you can also participate, as Paul did, uh, to uh, present your, your work and, and technology to, a, to the wider community. So please visit our website at iwcs.org for more uh, event details. Again, we, we thank Paul and uh, we certainly thank you for participating uh, and in today's event. And this concludes the event. We wish you uh, a great weekend. Thank you very much.